Once again, good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased uh, to um, introduce now the first panel in the Transform Seminar entitled the Enlargement of Post-Democratic uh, uh, Europe. Uh, this uh, first uh, panel um, is entitled the Bay of the Pigs uh, Center versus Periphery, uh, Realistic Perspective Question Mark. Uh, let me first of all uh, tell you about the changement. Um, it, unfortunately, uh, Raffaella Polini cannot join us. I just want to read you the email which I received from her. Dears, I'm very happy that the strike of Croatia airline workers seems to go very well. All my solidarity to them. We know that we have to pay sometimes a price for the struggles and unfortunately it's my turn. My flight to Zagreb has been cancelled and I cannot join you. I can assure you I will spend these days far away from Zagreb to mobilize for the altar summit. Uh, then on next Saturday, FIOM, our big and militant uh, metal workers union decided to declare their national demonstration in Rome as one stop of the symbolic caravan towards Athens. For us, it is very important to make altar summit rooted in the national popular struggles. So even uh, Far away from you, I will close to you in spirit, Raffaella Bolini, which is very nice. Um, and now um, to the panelists uh, who are actually joining us. This is uh, Elena Papadopoulou. Uh, Elena is working uh, with the economic department of the parliamentary group of Syriza, and she is also uh, one of the, I would say, pillars of the Transform Network, uh, worked for a very long time uh, with us. Then um, we have Francisco Luther, who is a Portuguese economist. He also used to be the national coordinator of the left bloc in Portugal, which is one of the two major left parties in Portugal and the one uh, which is part of the European left party and connected with Transform through Culture, which is the uh, political uh, foundation um, uh, close uh, to uh, the left bloc. And on my uh, left-hand side, uh, I have Tony Brook. Uh, Tony Brook is of Croatian uh, origin. Uh, he is now uh, working at Queen Mary's University in London. Uh, we are happy to have him here with us as well. And uh, with this uh, introductory mark, remarks, uh, I would pass the floor to the panel. Uh, just by saying that the um, question mark in the title is, of course, important. We are not the ones who unilaterally would say that uh, the ongoing crisis uh, should be interpreted as uh, a crisis emerging from uh, a contradiction or the contradiction between periphery uh, and the core of Europe at the same time. Uh, this also, uh, this relation also reflects uh, reality and in this tension or in this dialectic relation between the uh, social and the class-based interpretation of the crisis and at the same time uh, seeing that it actually has uh, an aspect uh, in which different uh, development levels, productivity levels uh, in uh, Europe uh, play a role uh, in this dialectic our uh, debate is going to evolve and to make things as easy as possible I would propose that uh, we start in the same sequence as I introduced the panelists which would mean that uh, Elena is speaking to us and the last word has then uh, let's say somebody who is uh, connected with the country in which we are having this discussion please Elena Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Walter, and uh, um, 
Good morning to all of you. I'm very happy to be here and I'm not saying that in the typical way. I'm really happy to be in this organization that I think is excellent. We're here, I was here for the first time last year in a very particular uh, conjuncture for uh, Greece because it was right after the first elections of the 6th of May uh, that Syriza uh, got uh, jumped from 4 to 16 percent in and then it was right before uh, the second election of the 17th of June when we almost uh, came close to taking actually the power of the government in Greece so uh, it it was a very interesting interesting interval uh, during which we had the discussions in this forum. Uh, so uh, the, the long-lasting uh, systemic crisis of capitalism for Greece did a lot more than push uh, Syriza uh, to a 27% for, from 4% of being a really small party. Uh, it, it really opened a vast ground of uh, questions and challenges and dangers, of course, uh, that are not uh, only concerning uh, the left forces. It's, it's uh, more and more obvious uh, during the, these years that they, it is also concerning uh, the bourgeois forces and their strategic goals, which they are trying to push forward uh, between their economic failures, uh, power exercise and uh, the defiance uh, for democracy that they are showing. So I think that uh, the topic of our discussion has uh, two implicit important issues. Uh, I think the first one is an analytical question. Uh, that has to do with the nature of the economic crisis and whether it indeed creates a center-periphery type of economic fragmentation. And I think the second uh, issue is a strategic question regarding the, the uh, progressive response of the left to the crisis. And more specifically, I think it's a question of uh, the productive reconstructions, reconstruction of economies such as Greece, Portugal, and other pigs economies, uh, as uh, it's now uh, usual to, to call them. Uh, and uh, not only how they are going to progressively exit the crisis, but what is their stance towards uh, the, the monetary union, a monetary union that, that is turning uh, more and more authoritarian, both economically and politically, uh, because it's trying not to implode uh, because of its structural deficiencies. And finally, uh, there is a question of how to do this. Uh, the, a question of alliances uh, and a question of uh, what the left in their respective countries should do in order, in order to, to foster these things. So let me start to say a uh, couple of brief things about the first question. Uh, the concept of the so-called pigs, which are, were Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece and Spain, emerged some years ago uh, when the mainstream propaganda that had uh, pinpointed Greece as an exceptional case of profligate uh, people, uh, in, uh, so the so-called as an outlier in a system that was working, in other terms, it tried to fall apart. So other countries started to have big problems and it seemed that the exception was not that exceptional. So they moved from the Greek uh, uh, unique case to the pigs. Uh, and what happened um, was that high indebtedness, either stemming from the banking sector, as it was the case in Ireland and Spain, or it came from the fiscal sector, as the, it was the case in Greece and in Italy and in Portugal, uh, was the excuse for the explicit application of uh, uh, what Naomi Klein called the shock doctrine. Uh, Tsipras also mentioned it uh, last uh, night. And it, it was really amazing if uh, you read Naomi Klein's book some years before and if you saw what was happening in Greece during this year. Uh, it, it, it was really uh, radical reforms in a very fast pace and it was in every aspect of uh, social and economic life. And in Greece, this doctrine initially managed to, uh, let's say, neutralize the social resistances. People 
uh, were, were really shocked. They, they didn't realize what actually was happening. But then the implications started to feel real in, the, in uh, their household budgets and their working conditions. And uh, uh, the resistances uh, started to grow um, in many fronts. <clears throat> And they culminated, I think, uh, with uh, the occupation of Syntagma Square uh, for more than a month. Um, and this was uh, in, uh, in 2011. Um, so to, the, to a bigger or lesser extent, I think that this shock doctrine uh, was imposed, it was, it was uh, expected to be imposed in all the so-called Bay of the Pigs, as the title of our discussion says. Uh, however, uh, what is becoming more and more clear is that the crisis does not only affect uh, the geographical periphery of the Eurozone. It is affecting the core countries. It is affecting France, definitely. It is affecting Germany. And um, yeah, there was uh, a recent uh, survey of the European Central Bank that uh, tried to, um, to argue that uh, the household, the German household, households were poorer than the households of uh, the peripheral countries and so the poor Germans were actually paying for the rich <laughs> periphery. Uh, and there was an interesting uh, response to that by an economist who's, who uh, said that uh, it's actually a very a case of very unequal distribution of the wealth that is produced in Germany that is causing this effect and not the other way around. So the, the, the point I want to make uh, by this is related to the center periphery kind of analysis. Uh, I think that instead of that, uh, we, uh, the situation is such that the conditions are created for a really internationalist uh, class struggle that equally involves the working people of uh, the South, but also the working people of the countries of the North, and uh, rather not a center-periphery type of division. And now let me turn to the second question, which I think is a strategic question. So uh, if we're talking about... Um, the, the strategy of the left in uh, uh, combating, the, the, in, in fostering a progressive exit from the crisis. I think the, the first uh, thing that we have to, to note is, is the problem, we have to, to counter is the problem of debt. Since uh, its servicing presupposes the use of huge amounts of annual state budgets for paying interests and amortization, and uh, this decreases the ability of uh, governments to exercise pro-growth economic policies uh, or finance the welfare state. Uh, and I, I think I should mention at this point that uh, the Greek public debt at this point is, uh, amounts to 100, close to 170 percent, while at the beginning of the crisis it was 110 percent, <laughs> which means that the excuse that the public debt uh, was the reason why this uh, fiscal adjustment was imposed to Greece uh, is really falling apart as an argument. So, um, uh, what uh, Syriza's position is on how to, to counter the, the debt problem uh, is definitely that we should have a, a cancellation of a big part of the debt. What part this is, uh, we can discuss and we can have, as uh, our president mentioned last night, uh, a, a big debt conference that uh, we can discuss this too. There are proposals from progressive economists uh, on that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we think that there should be a moratorium on, uh, on the interest payments. And the rest of the debt that is not cancelled has to be repaid um, with a growth clause. That means that uh, the interest rate should be related to the growth rate uh, in the same uh, spirit uh, as uh, it happened uh, in the London uh, Treaty 1953 for Germany. Um, so, uh, the, the very um, uh, important, the other very important uh, question uh, is uh, the, the question that we have to uh, make this productive reconstruction of our countries that I was talking to you about before. Uh, so the significant uh, difference in our approach is that we should, we are not talking about a more dynamic and sustainable capitalist growth 
in our concept of a productive reconstruction, but about a different model that bears uh, in its core the questions of production relations uh, through new forms of organization of, uh, of the productive processes, the protection of, the, of labor, the upgrade of labor, uh, the fair distribution of wealth, uh, full employment, uh, alternative uh, models of uh, production and consumption and the protection of the environment. So the, the question is not how to become better managers of the capitalist reproduction, but how through a new productive model we can really sow the seeds of, uh, of the social, socialist transformation of our societies. So these two issues that I touched upon briefly are uh, um, uh, basic uh, pillars of the work that Syriza is doing do during this period, uh, programmatic uh, and political work. But uh, uh, another question that uh, is important, and it has been de debated a lot in the Greek left, and I know that it's not only debated in the Greek left, but in the Portuguese left and uh, uh, in Spain, and it's, it's the question of the stance towards the Euro and the Eurozone. Uh, so le let me say that uh, I don't think this is an easy question to tackle, and uh, we, we uh, should not be straight forward uh, because I don't think uh, that the question is only about the currency. It entails broader political questions about European integration and uh, the relation, economic relations and political relations between European nations. Uh, however, uh, I, I really think that the position of the official position of series on that, which, which I share, uh, is uh, uh, much better uh, received in a, a, in a context like this, it, with interna an international context of left people, than it would be in any national audience, uh, for reasons that I will uh, explain before I finish. I, I'm, I'm finishing very shortly. Uh, so, uh, broadly speaking, in the left le or leftist spectrum, there are two views uh, about that. The one uh, is the view taken uh, by um, a tradition of uh, the European social democracy, and it's shared by uh, some Greek parties affiliated to that, uh, especially the democratic left uh, in Greece, which now is a party uh, that uh, participates in the coalition government and basically their position is uh, that we should stick to uh, the monetary union as it is, we should uh, uh, keep all our uh, obligations and we should wait until better days come and the uh, austerity can be relaxed. I won't give any attention to that because I think it's obviously dead end. Uh, and uh, there is the other um, uh, argumentation, uh, which is the so-called strategy uh, for the exit from the Eurozone. So uh, this, this um, uh, argument is coming from various parts of the left and some parts of Syria as well, uh, and various parts of the right as well. I'm sorry? Kukwe? Mm, not that... Uh, Kukwe has changed, has been changing their position on, on the issue of the currency. I can say some things later about that. Uh, it's not the most uh, powerful, uh, you know, uh, uh, voice for that. Anyway, uh, so <clears throat> this argument uh, goes as follows in, in how I understand it. Uh, Greece and for that matter Portugal, Spain and so on, they have nothing to expect as long as uh, they are a member of a reactionary monetary union like the Eurozone. Uh, national sovereignty is curtailed in such a context, therefore there can be no progressive policies uh, from a left government and Greece should exit the Eurozone so that it can uh, devalue its new currency, increase exports, uh, impose capital controls and apply an autonomous monetary policy outside uh, the European system. Uh, I, I have to say I disagree 
uh, with both the proposals that I just mentioned. So the uh, first thing that I think we have to take into account is that the basic pillar of the current austerity strategy is the so-called internal devaluation. So what this means, uh, it's that since there is no possibility to nominally devalue uh, the exchange rate to gain competitiveness, what a country should do is diminish wages and uh, dismantle uh, economic protection and uh, working uh, protection and employment protection so that the unit, lab unit labor cost falls. And this then is the devaluation in real terms and uh, it's basically a strategy to restore uh, capital profitability. Uh, so a currency devaluation in nominal terms <clears throat> following an exit from the Eurozone uh, uh, and adopting a national currency, I think uh, has exactly uh, the same effect. So it diminishes uh, real wages through higher inflation and uh, it decreases labor costs, thus again restoring capital profitability. So the common effect of the two strategies is that in both cases we have a regressive distribution uh, of income from the poorest to the wealthiest. So, uh, from a class perspective, this, the, the effect is the same, I think. Uh, so, that brings us, us to a first uh, political conclusion. Uh, exiting the Eurozone does not mean, in this sense, that either left government has more degrees of freedom, <clears throat> or nor that austerity will stop immediately. Uh, uh, what we, we think is important in such a debate is that it is possible to have austerity either inside or outside the Eurozone. A second political issue <coughs> is the message that uh, Greece will uh, pass on to the other countries that are on the same position. So we, we were actually proposing uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish people or uh, for that matter uh, other countries with similar problems that they, they should do the same. So uh, we should engage in a currency war uh, in a competitiveness uh, situation between us. Uh, uh, the problem is that <clears throat> the exiting the Eurozone uh, strategy encompasses uh, the value of competition, as I said, among the European people within it. Uh, whereas what we think, I think, and uh, Syriza's position is we should try to put forward, and this is a matter of uh, an issue of the alliances I mentioned at the beginning, is to try to foster uh, solidarity and economic cooperation in a totally different basis among us. And uh, in, in this sense, uh, 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 th uh, this is a sense that we can be more radical. Uh, the, alter the alternative that uh, I very briefly said some things about does not ignore the importance of uh, the nation state and the local struggles. On the contrary, it concedes that the primary locus of the struggle is within the nation state, but at the same time, and, and against the bourgeois class of the nation state. Uh, but it is also aware of the importance of reaching out to, to alliances and promoting uh, initiatives uh, beyond these boundaries in an internationalist perspective. So I'm going to stop here. I'm sorry if I <laughs> misused uh, the time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Um, the title for the panel is uh, The Bay of Pigs, uh, Center uh, versus Periphery. Uh, well, um, agreeing with what, with what uh, Elena just said, uh, I will not concentrate on the political issues of the debate on center versus periphery in Europe. Um, and on the differences between both parts of Europe, I will concentrate on some topics on what's common between center and periphery for the sake of the discussion and what's, what matters to our thought, common thought. Well, um, and I uh, suggest uh, the idea that what's common today in Europe between center and periphery is the shadow society. And I will explain what the shadow society is, um, taking the shadow economy 
the shadow social relations and the shadow political system in Europe. Very briefly, for time's sake. Well, first, the shadow society. When Cyprus um, entered in the recent crisis, two um, events were very uh, surprising. The first one was how stupid the European leadership is able to be. It was voted by unanimity um, with the acceptance of the European Central Bank, the IMF, and all the higher authorities consulted for the purpose to um, uh, tax the, the, the bank deposits in Cyprus. Of course, this was because of a racist attitude. It was like bombing an African tribe um, anywhere in, in, in Africa. So that proved something about the quality and uh, the vision, the strategic vision of the European leadership. But the second fact is more important. How come an economy representing 0.2% of the European GDP can have such a systemic effect on European finance and on the European banking system? And the answer, of course, is that even if it was less than that, it would have a systemic effect. And that's, of course, because of the dominance today of the shadow financial system. We know the concept which was created in order to describe that part of the financial system, which is not the commercial banking. So it's the insurance companies, action in derivatives markets, uh, swaps, CDS, and uh, hedge funds, and all that. What's new today is that the financial system is not anymore the banking system. That's a minor part of it partially integrated in this shadow financial system, but a very minor part and a very powerless part of the financial system in the world. The core of the financial system is the shadow financial system. The uh, market for derivatives was one third, five years before the recession of 2008, meaning the recession after the subprime crisis, five years earlier on, in 2003, a recession, by the way, it was something more than $100 trillion in the world. Five years later, at the core of the recession, it was $600 trillion. And the news today is that it is now a quadrillion, meaning... 14 times the GDP of the whole planet, 65 times the whole value of the New York stock market, meaning that one fictitious dollar, one nominal dollar in the New York stock market is valued 65 times more in the derivatives market. Why is this so important? Well, the shadow finance has at least two implications for what's important for me today. Well, first is that it dominates the banks. So it can imply bankruptcy and changes in the structure of the banks. The second is more important, is that the collateral for these markets is financial assets. And the collateral for financial assets is debt. So at the end, the collateral is wages, pensions, and taxes. Now, the economy of the debt provokes and manages recession. And recession and austerity, and the recession, requires the acceptance not only of debt, but of permanent indebtedness. So the acceptance of the future payments for generations, for the debt. Costas Duzinas uh, yesterday uh, talked about the moral pain, redemption, the concept implied in the notion of debt. The collateral 
of redemption is wages, pensions, and taxes, not just for the present, but for the future. So the economy of the debt, which is the counterpart for the shadow economy and the shadow finance, uh, is um, a coherent system to try to end the long wave of depression since the 70s, the falling rate of profit, in order to recover in a new society, in a new organization of the society, the role uh, of capital, of transfer for capital. The peculiarity is that if Marx used the concept of fictitious capital, which is a very right one, we know that the counterpart of the fictitious capital is a right on property. So it is fictitious except for those indebted. But the counterpart for the financial uh, system of the shadow economy, fictitious debt, is also the, um, the economy of common people for the generations to come. Now, my second point is on the shadow society, which is also something common between center and periphery. Well, you see, in Europe, if we look back for the very short period of this generation of austerity plans in the pigs and in the center now, in France, in Britain, in other countries, it will come to Germany, hopefully. Um, if we look back for this short period of time, a conclusion emerges. The neoliberal and austerity policies to manage the recession and austerity would not be possible in any of the countries by itself. It's only possible because it was imposed at European level. Neoliberal uh, austerity as it is imposed now could only come from outside. There's not a single country with a social, political, and electoral relationship of forces allowing for this type of programs. So we have a shadow politics as well. Well, do you remember some years ago when the German social democrats uh, developed the idea of the two-thirds society as a flexible proposal for a new form of economy? Not so long ago, we can conclude that a part of this shadow politics is imposed by the fact that Politics is obeyance to the neoliberal European level strategy. So one of the consequences for Europe is that we cannot expect nothing from the central left. The central left is not moderate. It would be very good if there would be some moderates in the central left. They are radical neoliberals. They are not moderate. The second conclusion is that there is no discourse on um, the, uh, this shadow pol political system does not look for consensus. It does not look for hegemony. It looks for coercion. In my country, that's the same in Greece, governments say to the people that we need to get poor. To get poor is the program and the aim, the target of austeri austerity, to impoverish. So this is not a discourse to get the hegemony. It's a discourse for coercion. So of course, there's a fight for words, equality, for instance, equality and flexibility, which mean precarious work and unemployment for a long time period. So there's a fight for common sense, as always, but common sense is no sense at all. My third point and uh, conclusion is on the shadow political system, which corresponds to the dominance of the shadow economy and of the shadow society. Of course, this type of policy implies fragmentation, which means erosion of democracy. There is not uh, development of democracy and not full, a full recognition of democracy as a means to solve problems. But 
that, that implies a change in the European institutions as well. Because you see, European Union was built as a strategy to absorb conflict, to absorb historical conflict between France and Germany and France and Britain, uh, Germany and Britain and so on and so forth, and to absorb conflict in the years after the Second World War in the sense of redistributing some sort of social contract with organized transfers from labor to capital, but under a social uh, contract. It was built to negotiate. Now, there's an end of negotiation. Because for once, there's an end of France as a partner to Germany in the European Union. And there's an end of the regional strategic organization of the European Union because the European Union does not look for consensus. It does not negotiate. The European institutions do not want to absorb conflict. They want to create conflict. They want to create protectorates and they do, do not fear, or apparently they do not fear, the erosion of democracy created by protectorates. That's why the pigs could be important if they could manage some sort of retaliation against debt. Because you see Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece and Spain represent 6% of the world GDP. When Russia defaulted on the debt 12 years ago, it represented one third of that. So it's much more powerful would it be a political entity? And the only possibility of it being a political entity is for the left to gain power in one or in several of these countries. That's why Syriza is so important for the left in Europe. It's the best part of the left in Europe, and it's the sole chance of beginning a retaliation against capital in Europe. And the only possibility of building that understanding is against, again, going, uh, uh, fighting uh, the uh, shadow uh, fin financial system. And that's why debt is the crucial point to rally people and to organize the social movement and to give back what they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Francisco. I give the floor now to Tony. Right, well, you leave me a difficult question because I really enjoyed listening and I took zillions of notes of what you were saying. I agree about what you said with Syriza. The uh, situation here is specific, so I want to say first few things about the context and then I would like to uh, do a little bit of reading of what you said, what I understood, and ask you a couple of questions. I mean, whether you want to you know, whether, we, whether it leads us to discussion, we'll see, but I'm really curious to hear your views further about what you said. Uh, so here we are in a situation in the whole Balkans that we don't have left of any, any meaningful word. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's collection of disparate activities and collectives, but there is nothing that can challenge in elections, which is important. So therefore for us to take a view of what would it be to position Croatia when it enters EU soon towards the center the very point from which you ask that question, standpoint, is non-existent here. So we cannot ask those questions. They are meaningless for us. Uh, but we have, do have other questions to ask, which is how to get to a position of Syriza that you have a political party of that kind. Uh, uh, the questions that Srećko asked yesterday at Tsipras, you know, that these, these are key questions for us. So a lot of our questions are questions that you had to ask yourself last 15 years. So I think it's it's very important, I agree, with that, that, you know, uh, that you keep on going and if we can get uh, left anywhere close to political power, it will help in a lot of other places, uh, including Croatia and Balkans, I think, as a whole. So for us, we have a lot of questions which are more, I think, methodological questions. How do we get there? And not the questions, how do we position ourselves towards the capital and the center? Because we have no chance of, of uh, um, making those questions politically plausible. No, no one can do anything with it, uh, uh, especially not in a public uh, sphere. So um, you few things you reminded me of where both of you spoke that uh, it's so the shadow let's start from Rafael's shadow banking um, the shadow finance it's 
Like, can we afford at this moment to ask, so I'll ignore what I prepared to say actually this morning because I think it's much more interesting to what you had to say because we here, you know, we have to do a lot of work before we can speak of those issues. So, can we afford not to go back to hard questions of value versus monetary expression of value in terms of human development? I know these are hardcore questions, but I mean, I had an email this morning from Alan Freeman, the paper he wrote on uh, recently in Journal of Australian Journal of Political Economics precisely on this issue, so I'm really glad to hear it here. And he asked for comments, number of people, and uh, uh, the paper is how do we relate what we know through Marxist economics about, for example, falling rate of profit with uh, securities, with this enormous 60, 14 times of GDP of the planet amount. So to put it on a, on a, on a slightly concrete level, the abstraction, uh, you mentioned uh, the different mode of production. Um, the question is again, so can we afford not to open the discussion what is value from the perspective of the worker? Uh, the one that in national accounting is defined in outcomes, i.e. what is achieved when a dollar is spent on health, education, housing, pensions, egalitarian measures, distribution according to need. Uh, and can we afford to keep looking at, that, at those sectors as non-productive, as spending of value? Uh, because that's what often from the left we do, and then we fall into a trap that even the national accounting, which is quite neoclassical, doesn't fall into that trap. Even they say every single dollar spent on public services is a productive, uh, uh, it produ produces value, but only value of the total cost of production. So there is no, there can be no surplus value in public services. So I think that's one of the uh, places where, where we should uh, mount a challenge. Uh, because when you said different mode of production, immediately I asked myself, one of the notes I had here for us for the next years to come in, in Balkans, I think, is that we have to reject the Western Marxist view of East Europe, socialisms we had in East Europe. And we have to beat uh, the, the, the view that, you know, what we had here were just forms of state capitalism at its argument. So it's, it's, some, it's a, a lot of theoretical work that we have to do, but luckily we have people like Catherine Samari and Mandel, and there is a tradition of people in Lebovis today challenging that view from different point of view. But when we look from that view, which is a view, view of needs and human development, I don't think we can afford uh, uh, to stay within the, within the monetary accounting. So alone, it has to be use values and monetary accounting in one composite set of composite indexes that will then express quality of life because otherwise, how can you show in Greece, you know, I mean, GDP is a measure entirely, entirely constructed from day one to account from, for the crisis in US, uh, for the Great Depression, and then later on for uh, the uh, war. It's a war, it's a war accounting mechanism. And Simon Kuznets, who is the father of national accounting in US, interestingly, a Russian guy who at the age of 22 moved to, to New York and uh, became this very talented young man who was given this task to create first national accounting. He said, you cannot do accounts. And this is something that came up earlier in, in discussions and we had it in Ljubljana. In, in, uh, this is something I asked Varoufakis, which is the purpose of economic activity. Unless you define purpose of economic activity, you cannot account for economic activity. And we know in neoclassical accounting, which is mostly what informs national accounts, as we know them today, standard uh, ESA 1995 or 2008 update, it is neoclassical, which is every dollar spent is a value created, but no surplus there. So the only way we account for surplus in, in, in a purely capitalist manner, which is what we have remarks. So 14 times amount of uh, uh, GDP it totally in the world, we have in, 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 in what we can call a form of fictitious capital, yes, in securities floating out there in the space. And that creates pressure on a real banking system which provides a service of value circulation which then has two layers of collateral, in financial assets first and second in collateral debt which is wages, pensions, taxes. Uh, so, Alan Freeman in this paper, what he did, he read, he included for the first time the whole of fictitious capital, which w we don't do normally in Marxist economics because we, we ignore it for, for the methodological reasons that Marx gives us. He included everything in it. And then it says, of course, if you include it, the rate of profit actually just goes down and down and down and down because the mass of, of monetary expression there is, is enormous, 14 times the GDP. So my question to Raffaello, and the question is to you. Uh, can we afford to not construct a new mode of production which will look at experiences from East Europe that we had in socialism? Well, you know, eight, in, in mid-80s, 85%, and that's when it went down. It was over 90%. All production was controlled by uh, 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 social enterprises, I mean, owned by workers, nominally, of course, run by management, but there were forms of self-management where they had to 
uh, discuss with workers literally in factory halls, large capital investments, new staff, employees on the board. This has to be discussed. So there were some elements, and country knows far more than I, so she can she can fill us in on this. Uh, so can you inf can you afford in, in in Greece to talk about this agenda and not to look at the East Europe? That's one question of, of our experiences, and to do it in a, in, a, in a way which will be productive for your own struggles and not to look what, what most of Western Marxism has been telling us for the last 50 years, which is that it was state capitalism. We need to ignore that question. No, it was not. It was, as Michael Lebowitz would say, different mode of production fighting each other, contested reproduction. That's what we had in East Europe. That's his thesis that I defend that thesis really fiercely. We had new mode of production according to need, fighting with the remnants of capitalism, or in case of Preobrazensky in, in Soviet Union, we had feudal, you know, we had kulaks. So that's one question. And the second question, can we afford not to look at different, dif almost different categories of value that are floating in the air in 14 times GDP and in real economy? Or is this really one set of values that are, according to Marx, you know, fluctuating around the price? Uh, in other words, to cut this dead trap, because it's a, if I read Rafaela correctly, it's a dead trap, the, the, the financial sector up there floating. It, it puts such an enormous pressure on a real economy that it forces us to do, to create shadow of politics and to create political decisions which follow from the pressure above. So, I, I mean, my proposal would be, uh, it's a hunch in its intuition, Alan Freeman doesn't do it, he just includes it in a falling rate of profit. It's to say that's not value. There is not value that's connected with labor time. So there is no connection between labor time and the value floating up there. And that is, a, I mean, that is a view that you cannot take if you follow Marx closely or if you follow any sort of conventional economics. Institutionalists, all these institutions from US or neoclassicals, because of, of, for them, dollar is a dollar. Security is a security. As soon as it becomes liquid, it's a, it's a dollar. So it's a tier two liquidity. So what I'm saying is, if we take what Michael Lebowitz is trying to tell us for the for, for last 10 years, and we've been reading him a lot in Balkans, is the view of the worker, which is, I think, what you're trying to do with Syriza, the view of the social, to, total social reproduction of the, of the workforce and of people. I think that view has to uh, conceptually cut off the upper layer, as this is not value. It, does not rep it has no, and nothing to do with our labor time. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult proposition, but I think it's, it's the only proposition that I can think, maybe have ideas that gives us an opportunity to, to have different kind of social accounting, to, diff, to, to account from the bottom collateral, if you want, which is wages, pension, taxes, and income, in ways in which we will be able to cut this deadly umbilical cord with the upper layer of, of uh, tier two liquidity, uh, which has 14 times percent of the GDP. So, so these are my questions. Too. I, I'm really enjoyed. I mean, I wish I could hear more in, in that. Sorry about the difficulties of the questions, but I, I think you just kind of raised them. Thanks very much for this very interesting, challenging contribution. I have noted that you put two questions, but uh, apart from them, there is now the possibility that we include the audience in the discussion, but we won't forget these two questions. So if there is the wish to contribute, to comment, or to ask additional questions, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, please can somebody take care for Uh, uh, to the uh, uh, starting question, uh, to the starting question, uh, I didn't have started it truly, but I have the feel, feeling out of my stomach <laughs> that this uh, metropolis periphery is now uh, 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 diminishing in the global scale because it's uh, coming up in the national states scale. If you think about the, the fightings of the banlieue in, Paris, uh, in, in France, you think that the uprising in London, I think it is some form the metropoles take their own per periphery inside them. And uh, they are consisting of illegalized migrant workers, uh, refugees, uh, very dispossessed people of their own uh, uh, aboriginals <laughs> and uh, they, are, they are separated from the whole of the society to some uh, slum similar uh, towns 
uh, this seemed to be in, in just a impression. I, I didn't study it thoroughly. Eh? Aber I have the feeling the periphery, periphery, they are trying to, to put the periphery just in the center of the metropoles. And uh, another question about. Uh, no, I have left the, <laughs> uh, the line. Okay, thank you. Who will be the next one? Ah, that's why. Yes. <laughs> Um, no, 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 I didn't Is it okay? It. No, it's okay. okay. Someone has to take a power. In fact, I, I wanted to take the, this uh, bike just, just to, to, to say how sorry I feel for not having uh, Samir Amin in our uh, company. Because uh, I, I miss his arguments uh, and I miss... Uh, a fight with him. So, since he's not here, I will try to, to play Samir Amin myself. Uh, and I would like to... <laughs> no, no, just posing some questions. Okay? Uh, so, uh, I, I, I absolutely agree with you that there is a, a consensus among... Uh, uh, the, the ruling classes and, and uh, uh, ruling parties, including social democrats, throughout Europe for the austerity politics, politics which are imposed in all countries. And as uh, Francisco said, if uh, uh, these policies would not apply everywhere, it could not be applied somewhere. But... Uh, uh, there are some, uh, I mean, there are some differences uh, in the way they are applied or imposed to different countries. For example, I, I, I remember, and uh, well, most of us, especially the Greeks, remember that uh, before the uh, May elections, I don't know if it was even after the May elections last year, the right-wing leader, uh, Samaras, the now prime minister, was uh, uh, speaking very hardly against austerity imposed by the northern countries. Although he was part of uh, uh, the same family, uh, political family with, with Merkel. And... Uh, uh, he had uh, uh, put it out, and, and he had uh, 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 suffered. <laughs> it was Samir, <laughs> and he had suffered extreme pressures to to change his position. Uh, and now I think that he's very ha happy with what is happening because he's so hard uh, uh, neoliberal that he's uh, he loves seeing. Uh, wages uh, uh, being diminished uh, at the level they are, uh, the, the uh, people being unemployed and uh, in precarious employment, uh, and the, uh, so that they can offer uh, the, their labor for nothing, and at the same time that uh, 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 dismissals are permitted for the first time in the public sector, and uh, plus the fact that uh, Everything is being privatized because that's what he had in mind. But in order to to to, to have uh, 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 to, to, to can speak to his audience and supporters in 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 Greece, he had to be anti-memorandum at a certain time. So he was forced to do that. Uh, would that imply that uh, uh, there is? Uh, some kind of, of uh, imperialist action from uh, uh, the center of Europe towards uh, uh, the countries of the south, uh, the peripheral countries. And uh, uh, even if this is not the case, uh, or it's not exactly the case, uh, what would you think of some kind of 
alliance or front or um, uh, how, how, how they said it, enhanced cooperation among uh, uh, the countries of the South or among the political, uh, the radical political forces of the South, which for different reasons are in a different environment than the, the uh, countries of the North. Would that be uh, uh, for good for the common cause that uh, the radical left has in Europe, or is it against it? Um, I would like to pose a similar question that I posed yesterday to Costas Duzinas because I again feel that we, we are making a huge, huge theoretical and political fallacy when we are only focusing on European Union and we are Eurocentric and thinking only about periphery of European Union for so the peaks countries I've heard today. Uh, because firstly what is happening, and this is theoretical fallacy, uh, what is happening to Greece is nothing so majorly new in the world because structural adjustment program programs are happening in countries of the so-called third world for 30 years. The same experience, were, well, the similar experience for the people on the ground happened in, uh, in all of Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. So I think that this is a theoretical fallacy if we think that this what is happening is uh, that only now the financial systems and uh, the elites from the north decided to reconstruct one country. They, they were doing it for the last 30 years in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, so this is a theoretical fallacy that we are making. And also that is a huge, huge political fallacy because we are not able to think of the struggles in the Africa, Latin America, Asia that were happening and to incorporate their, their ideas, their ways of resisting and think about them. Uh, also it is a political fallacy because we are not connecting with them. Well, I've heard yesterday that uh, Tsipras was in um, Venezuela and also the, the Bolivian Prime Minister w um, ought to be talking here uh, tomorrow, but he, he will not come. So we, we are now trying to connect with those movements and people from other countries. And we, I think that we really, really should do that. Even uh, Eric Toussaint will, now, will today be talking. He is promoting uh, the idea of cancellation of that for the third world countries. And I think that we in the European Union, especially the countries from the periphery, should more connect with the countries from this, how to put it, world periphery, really hardcore periphery <laughs> of the world, and to, uh, to connect with them, to think with them, to develop new ways of resisting their Troika, which is the IMF, World Bank, the Paris Club, and our Troika, which is the European Commission and Europe, uh, Europe Central Bank. Thank you very much. I now have two persons on the list. This is Francine and this is Catherine. And with this, I have to close uh, in order to finish in time. Uh, we continue in the, in, in the next panel and then you can come back again. Please, Francine. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have two points. Um, first question for the Portuguese friend. I very much like this analysis by the shadow economy and shadow politics. Um, for the shadow economy, the shadow financial system, I wonder if you take seriously the attempts that are now announced by G8, G20 to fight tax havens. Do we, take, do we have to take this seriously or is this just another way of doing as if they were tackling problems. And my second point is about this center periphery, and I very much agree with what our friends just said. Uh, maybe not exactly with the same conclusions, but I very much agree with, with, the basic, with the basic point. I think looking at Europe in a center periphery, it, it's, it's, it's not correct anymore. I mean, it, Italy was at the core of Europe, now it has become periphery. France still is at the core of Europe. It may become periphery. I mean, and if, if you look at the whole picture, what we see is that the whole of Europe is becoming periphery. And we should, should take that into account. I mean, if Germany thinks that it will continue to sell its Mercedes to, to, to China, that is an illusion. 
I mean, the whole of Europe is becoming periphery. And I think that the left has to take that into account because we need to articulate those struggles at all the different levels. We need national struggles, European struggles, global struggles. And we should not discuss here or there or there. We need to struggle at all the levels, all different levels. I do not think that we can learn from Latin America what we have to do, because the situation is too different. But yes, we should link up with the movements and try to have some kind of convergence and see where we can work together, because I do think we have the same objective, but we will have to adapt our struggles at our own situation. Thank you very much. I have to apologize. I have two different program information, and the program information, which is the more colorful one, allows us to continue until 12 o'clock, so that's what we are going to do, and that means I can collect another round of, of questions. Yeah, um, uh, I will. I uh, agreed uh, completely with the, the general uh, presentation made by Elena and Francisco. Uh, I, as I will intervene in the next uh, uh, forum, I, I will not uh, discuss about Eastern Europe and Balkan, but uh, uh, concentrate on the issue of that forum, that uh, so-called PICS. Uh, first, uh, but uh, a remark: we should not oppose what is to be combined. And the, the, the capitalist system is not a kind of multitude or a, a capital in abstraction. It is organized, and our enemy is organized at different levels, shadow way of uh, being organized, but also very concrete institutions. And uh, the, for me, the European level is needed for the, the working class uh, resistance. Uh, not because uh, European uh, issues are the only one to be dealt with, uh, with uh, uh, leaving aside uh, what was the turning point in the international crisis of capital, which was in the 70s, uh, and which was uh, the, the falling rate of profit there, with offensive in, 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 in core countries, in US and in, 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 in South countries in, in the 80s and so on. But still, there is a, a, an existing organization of the bourgeoisie at the European level, which is turning into a very repressive form of organization. And that is why we have to be organized at that level, too. And uh, uh, it is also because efficient uh, struggle against another aspect, which are not, is not discussed here, which is environmental issues. And even solidarity with South question, we, we could have a level to, to, to be efficient politically and even economically if we had another uh, relationship with force at the European level. But my question now on peace. Uh, related to what Francisco said, uh, I, I believe, and that's my, um, my question, that there was a turning point in 1989 in the, the radicalization of uh, neoliberal and the, 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 the kind of uh, political economy which was implemented at the European level, Eastern Europe, Europe especially, especially, was used to uh, radicalize the attack in the core country uh, in, uh, on the uh, flag uh, 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 tax uh, system uh, and, uh, and also on, uh, on the labor code and so on. So, and in the general now, it's the, the case also for the southern periphery. But my question for the southern periphery, the vocabulary pigs uh, was uh, introduced in the recent crisis, but I, I want to, to remind that before 89, it was an opposite vocabulary which was used to describe what was called the cohesion countries. When uh, Spain, Portugal, Greece were uh, entering after a dictatorship, it was still both, I would say, in the combination of a neoliberal turn in the world, but also in Europe and on European continent, it was after the Portuguese revolution, 1973, also, in the bipolar uh, world, with the, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, West European bourgeoisie still afraid that the Greek, the Portuguese, and Spanish people could go towards another direction, like in Chile and so on. And so there was a, a radical budget increase 
as completely opposed to what was done when Eastern European countries entered, a radical budget increase towards the South. And uh, it was called the cohesion uh, funds and the cohesion countries, not the pigs at that time. So that's a question to you about that turn. Thanks, Kathleen. In, in, some, uh, uh, some, uh, in some things, it's, uh, to, to, to try to give an answer to you, uh, uh, this periphery question. Uh, 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 I, I think we should stop to think in national frames of, of national states, because it doesn't fit to the uh, organization of, 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 of uh, financial system, uh, production system and not even on the on the on the on the uh, floor social floor there, there are no national uh, societies in in our times ne ne never not in austria uh, uh, for, for instance vienna is the second largest serbian city biograd Bech, novi sad yeah in Chicago, Chicago. yes, yeah. and therefore, therefore, it's, it's, uh, you you have to put to, to put it away. It's 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 not on the, it's not right on the financial. Uh, it's it's not right on the production sector. It's not right in the social sector, and I think that I, I want to underline uh, I, my feeling that we, the periphery is just in my, as a inside our heart. And we, uh, a group near to, to, to us, I'm from Grundrisse in Vienna, uh, uh, invited last week uh, uh, three house workers from Madrid called Tor Territorio Domestico to present what they have done and how they work to organize the house workers in Madrid and they have uh, done it for two years now and they have uh, succeeded to organize uh, it, uh, 30 of this for a longer side till now. Yeah? And they are all coming from Ecuador, Dominicanische Republic, all colors, all races, and they, uh, they, they develop a, a common fight about uh, working conditions and about uh, immigration laws uh, stay, uh, to becoming inhabitant and this, that's uh, yeah, Staatsbürgerschaft, citizenship and so on. Yeah? And I, I, it is a very inspiring thing, I think. And it, 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 it is a proof that we should stop thinking in national terms. And, and, and the last, what I, I lost the line, uh, the most important for, uh, for all, I think uh, we must uh, think about how to start uh, socialism as the pro starting the process to communism today. And I have a suggestion. Comrade Lenin said <laughs> socialism is Soviets and electrification. Electrification is finished. I would suggest uh, uh, socialism is uh, commune in uh, unconditional basic income. And then the processes will start that leads to communism. Yes, but Slavo gave you excellent answer to that yesterday, and you got no arguments to counter it. So who else uh, is asking for the floor? I'm afraid I was so threatening in <laughs> presenting this tight time school. Uh, schedule that nobody uh, wants the floor, so then I give it back to the to, to the panel. And uh, I start with you because otherwise I would risk that you find another no, I've set got, I've of got, questions. I've got nothing to add. I would just like to uh, maybe just add to one of the questions because I think yeah, questions were great. So the question for Elena is, uh, so when you said, you said that uh, you're looking for a different form of solidarity and economic co cooperation on different bases, that was in your conclusion, yes? Would that in any way possibly include discussions to include, oh, so what I had in presentation, what I didn't say is that we need methods to deal with the enemy. One of the methods is fear. Use fear, you know, we need to instill fear in the enemy. And uh, that was uh, Anina Kalternbrunner, 
who finished her PhD recently at SOAS, she's at Leeds University now, uh, a heterodox economist. Two years ago, no, last year at May Day, she said that perhaps we need the left, whatever it is now, I mean, you're the strongest player, so you're the only one who can start those discussions, I think, to start discussions about a different currency of the peripheral countries because of the different level of technological you know, advancement, because of different productivity levels. So perhaps what she said, this was really interesting at the end of her discussion, and I thank her for introducing fear as a method, and let's write it down, okay, that's a method. She said, if we just start those discussions, even though we are not in power, if Syriza goes around, collects the people in the left, and we actually have a serious conference that's publicly announced where we say, it are the needs of the people, and needs are the people of those countries, are not the needs of the capital of the North that's imposing it. And we know that what's being imposed on us are not the needs of the people of the North, it's capital that's imposing it. We have different views on what is a currency and how it should be run. So she said just the negotiations that are taking place, the public conference would actually instill fear in Brussels and actually, you know, Merkel and Brussels would think differently about their political position towards the periphery because those discussions are going. So would that be a possible point of uh, solidarity and cooperation? Thank you. Would you like to reply directly or? The combination of what? Yes, ten seconds. Okay. Um, well, a, a number of points were raised. Uh, of course, it's, it's not possible to, to deal deeply with um, all of them. Uh, I agree with m the, many of the, the implications and ma many of the thoughts which were offered, um, and I will go briefly on, on some of the topics. Well, first on, on the more um, global approach, as uh, uh, Tony suggested, and uh, other people, and then on more, more concrete questions. Well, there's a statistical paradox which was discussed by Alan Freeman, Andrew Kleeman, and other, other people, which is uh, why do statistics show that there is um, um, some recovery of profitability of the United States uh, economy and some of the European economies, but there is no accumulation, there is no investment. Well, and they tried to address that, uh, suggesting that we are measuring wrongly profits and uh, the, the profit rate, as you mentioned. And uh, re in the recent article by, by Alan Freeman, he proposed to include securities and money capital, what he calls money capital, meaning the short-term capital assets, in the, uh, to, be, to, to, sum, to be summed in the, in the, the, the ratio of, of um, prof, uh, the the rate of profit. If that happens, then it would be clear that there is no increase in the profit rate. Well, this is arguable. I'm very sympathetic to this approach. I think it's um, useful, uh, intelligent, and comprehensive uh, to include this sort of, uh, of money capital in, in uh, the account the accountancy of, of, uh, of capital. Um, so the, the conclusion is, is, is right to, in, my, in my point of view. Now, does the, this challenge Marx's uh, point of view of, of, on fictitious capital? I don't feel that. I feel very comfortable on the idea of fictitious capital, and I even think that you should extend it daringly to the idea of fictitious debt, because we are discussing not only odious debt, Ill, uh, illegitimate debt, but also fictitious debt as well. In this sense, the connection between money capital or fictitious capital or fictitious debt with the creation of value, of labor value, is still central to the reasoning and to the real social relation, since uh, whenever the collateral of debt is a claim on future production, uh, you have a claim on the share of the future labor creation of value, uh, labor value. In that sense, yes, debt is... Uh, 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 a part of uh, the creation of, of value for the next uh, years or generations and its value in the historical sense. Um, 
I would add that this is also very important for our understanding of the social relations and the evolution of, of the social production because it proves that one of the developments of the last years is the increase and uh, emphasis on, on absolute extraction of surplus value. For many years, productivity, uh, development of productivity methods, uh, flexible methods in the workplace, um, um, centered on the extraction of relative surplus. Now, I think we are in the age of absolute extraction of surplus. In this sense, well, consider what could be a modern theory of exploitation. We would uh, look in four different combined places to understand exploitation. Well, the first is the classical, non-paid work in the work, in the productive work or in the creation of the social capacity for realization of production, non-paid work. The second would be that part which is paid to the workers by the fact that they don't pay public services, health and education. That's part of the wage, of the indirect wage. So the reduction of the public services increased the exploitation because a larger part of the wage, of the paid wage, would be paid as public services. Now, there's a third part, which is quite obvious, which is the taxes. Paid wage, paid taxes. And if the taxes increase, it diminishes the part of the paid work. And uh, the fourth part of that exploitation theory would be pensions. Because pensions is a devolution of the rights of the paid work for the future time of our lives. So if pensions are reduced, this is also the increase of absolute extraction of surplus value. So in all the four, uh, increase on unpaid work, increase of the working time, increase of taxes, decrease of the public services, increase, uh, decrease of the pensions, all are for uh, different forms of exploitation and of development of the absolute extraction of, of surplus. And uh, so that favors the change in the structure of the relationship, uh, uh, the social relationship in the, in the sense of this discussion on the profitability and on the connection. It increases the connection on the claims on the future uh, transfers of labor value to, to, to capital. Well, of course, this is a very uh, large and very important discussion. I think most of the points of the, the points by, by Tony are quite quite uh, good and quite interesting, and I, I share what what he said. Now, uh, very briefly on on, on different points. Uh, yes, the center and periphery exist in the central countries of Europe. Of course, in Vienna, in Frankfurt, in Berlin, in Rome, in Madrid. We have the third world inside Europe. All the world is inside Europe. We have all the world inside Europe. Not only the migrants, but uh, long-term unemployed, the impoverished people, um, the, the collapse of the welfare system, meaning that uh, there is no social protection for the, el the elder, uh, and all uh, that. Um, I would not go as far as to suggest that the notion of the nation state is not useful. Because, yes, there may be many people from Serbia in Vienna, but I would guess that uh, if uh, we would propose to the Austrian people to integrate Serbia, they would not like that. And if we would propose to Serbia to integrate Austria, they would say, remember, there is a nation state, there is a nationality, and yes, they exist. So I, I think that for the left, the problem is not the, the con contraposition of uh, nation states against internationalism, is to understand that there is a culture, a democratic space, a social space, a political conflict organized in the nations, and, uh, but they can... Uh, 
be put together in, in common objectives, in common fights, and that, that I fully agree. What's new now, there's a political novelty in Europe, is the, con the, the structure, the institutional control on the countries. And, you, you, uh, well, we came from different countries, but of course, people from, from Greece or from Portugal, from Spain, it's slightly different. Uh, but uh, from Ireland, they would know what means this uh, um, um, inspection by the Troika authorities from two or three months is, uh, um, every year. It means that there is no check passed by the government, which is not approved, pre previously approved by the Troika authorities. You cannot build an hospital, you, you cannot rebuild a center of health, you cannot rebuild a small school without the authorization of the Troika authorities. They are the government. There is no other government. There are some valets serving the government, which is the Troika. And that changes so much the political capacity of a country of understanding itself, of fighting itself for uh, choices. Um, so that's so deeply an erosion of democracy that you can understand why it's so important to regain the legitimate power of the state, the legitimate power of the nation, to lead the nation against this sort of authorities and to lead it in the sense of what was suggested, yes, common uh, regroupments of, of different countries, of different social movements, of different so social activities, in order to get more powerful in all these levels of, of confrontation that can be deci decisive from the Alter Summit to the European elections next year and for, for, for all the social movements we have now. Because it's very clear now that we don't have time. We don't have time. Time is running out. We don't have more time because we are losing generations. Austerity is destroying so much, is damaging so much the democratic consensus, democratic capacity, democratic institutions that this sort of, um, of uh, retaliation, uh, this sort of counterattack is, um, is so, so important. In, in that sense, what I suggest is that alliances are, are required. Yes, they are. Uh, in the sense that we fight for leadership. That's what left is about. We fight for leadership. And we fight for leadership in a different, in a changing world. Do you remember then that 30 years ago, when, when Mitterrand was elected president of France, one of the first decisions he took was to nationalize all the banks, all the insurance companies, and some of the most important industrial groups in France. What happened afterwards? for the social democracy to be so deeply rooted as a part of the neoliberal system, of the, fi the, the shadow financial system, of this sort of political austerity, political authoritarian, author authoritarian um, um, ideas. Uh, and that's a deep challenge for the left. So uh, the left is, uh, must look for, for a leadership which uh, represents all these sorts of uh, uh, traditions, of all these sorts of uh, social groups, all these sorts of aspirations of, of different people. Now, two more points. From this point of view, what Catherine said, that there was a radicalization after 1989, yes, it's very, very clear. There's a deep radicalization, a deep change in Europe with all the changes in these in the eastern parts, but I will not speak about that because I, do, I, I, I don't know well enough to, 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 to speak about it. Um, uh, Francine asked, uh, well, sh will, would the uh, G20 um, follow um, what they said about uh, offshore um, financial centers. No, of course no. Do you remember that George Bush, the president, said after the attacks of uh, um, September 11 that they should close the offshores? He said that because he knew after the attacks how bin Laden had used the offshore financial centers in order to uh, hide his money and to finance a uh, very uh, costly operation. He said so and nothing happened. 
Nothing will happen. And it's very clear why. Because these sort of governments are Goldman Sachs governments. When you have in Europe Mario Draghi and, and Monti and all these people coming out directly from Goldman Sachs, you understand why these enormous financial systems, which are banks as well, but which are centers of, of the shadow financial systems, well, how, how deeply they do and how they need to have this sort of international transfers of, of capital. That's, by the way, why one of the, the decisions of the first day of a left government in Europe is not only to re reject the memorandum, but to take the only attitude which allows for the rejecting the memorandum, which is imposing the, the capital controls, um, the controls of, of the international transfers of, of capital in order to protect the countries and to, and to take decisions by themselves. So that's a very important thing. One final point on the relations on, on Latin America. Well, uh, what, what you said, I think you are right. We should look at the world because the, the experience of the IMF ad adjustment programs were, um, are old in, in Africa, are old in Latin America, and are interesting in Latin America because they were rejected and they were defeated in Latin America. Yes, they were. Um, and, uh, well... I was recently in Argentina and I discussed with the government of Argentina their experience of the default and the, their the cancellation of the debt and renegotiation of the debt because it's so interesting for us, for Greece and for other countries. Of course, when I went there, Alexis had already been there, so, so you see, well, there is some effort to, to, to know about this. But be careful in the same, at the same time because we are dealing not just with the open political process, but with governments. And they have their own limitations and their own restraints. For instance, you remember what Dilma Rousseff said about the debt of Greece and the debt of Portugal. We don't help them because the notation by the international agencies is garbage and we don't buy garbage. So, the political capacity of these governments is also very much constrained by their own political programs and their own relations to the international finance uh, capital. Anyway, there is no left if it's not able to look for alliances and to, to look for learning. And I certainly strongly agree that uh, uh, if the European left is not able to, under, to, understand, to, to learn with the North and the South and the Center and the East and the West and, uh, and Africa and Latin America and Asia, by the way, which may be the most important part of the world in the next, uh, in the next years, uh, we do not deserve to call ourselves uh, what we are. So, I, as I was uh, <laughs> um, not brief at all in my first presentation, I will be brief now, especially because uh, Francisco replied uh, in most of the issues and I fully agree with what we, he said. So, uh, but the questions were very uh, challenging and especially uh, what uh, Tony put on the table, which are hardcore theoretical issues that need a lot of discussion and uh, of course I, I even don't feel uh, that I'm uh, in a position uh, to uh, be very analytical about them. Uh, just on the first issue that you mentioned, uh, the, the question that uh, uh, Sreczko put to Alexis yesterday, I would very uh, strongly urge you to hear uh, Mr. Harris Golemis tomorrow, who's going to be talking about the emergence of the new left. And uh, there he's going to tackle uh, the issue of how uh, Syriza came about and uh, uh, how it became so big and what were the factors that led him and what are the difficulties that it is facing now uh, that it is a, a party of the major opposition because it's different kinds of challenges that it has to face now. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very interesting, uh, interested in the question you put about uh, the issue of value. 
uh, because um, some years ago when the wages started falling uh, rapidly in Greece, um, I, I remembered the mainstream economics that I did in my university that were talking about the nominal rigidity of wages. So where did this nominal rigidity go when the wages fell in uh, you know, two months by 30%? So then I, I thought that we should tackle exactly what is the, how the value of labor is being forced, uh, formulated. And we should put that into the discussion. And I started reading Marx uh, on that, uh, which I think is very relevant to what is uh, what has happened during these years. I have to admit, I, I didn't, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, go as far as, uh, uh, you know, a final uh, text on that. But I definitely agree with you that this is a topic uh, that uh, we should pinpoint, especially in the context of uh, the productive reconstruction of and of the productive relations, not only of uh, the sectors that we have to, uh, you know, uh, to, to pinpoint in our economies uh, of relative or comparative advantages and so on. It's more uh, deep issues that we have to deal with. Um, so, uh, I, I very much uh, agree with what you said, and Francisco also mentioned it, uh, that there is a periphery inside the core. Uh, the immigrants uh, and uh, the low paid and the unemployed, uh, they are a kind of exploitation basis inside the core countries. And, um, but I also uh, disagree with the importance of, of the nation state. Uh, on the contrary, I, I would say that I feel th that this period um, is a period where people need to look back and feel secure inside their identity, their national identities. Um, I mean, in, in Greece, uh, parallel to the rise of Syriza, there is a big rise of the extreme right, uh, the, the neo-Nazis, I mean, the Golden Dawn. And uh, their narrative that appeals to the people uh, is a narrative of national sovereignty and, uh, you know, building this national identity again. So I, I, I would keep my attention uh, to the level of the nation state uh, as well. Um, I, I heard your question yesterday to Kostas Duzinas, and uh, um, I agree uh, partly that we should have this broad view uh, of the world because this is a structural crisis and of, uh, of capitalism. And uh, even though other structural crises have happened between uh, the Great Depression of uh, the 30s and this one that is the, the second global big uh, depression, uh, they were uh, crises that were uh, located in uh, some parts of the world and didn't affect other parts of the world. They, they, they were uh, capitalist crises, but not as big. But this one is uh, so big that we have to look at it. But at the same time, uh, we, uh, we are dealing with a shock of our own in Europe now. Uh, and it, it, I, I I agree very much with what Catherine said. We have to give a fight against the European bourgeoisie. And uh, in this sense, we have a lot to learn uh, from, uh, from other experiences, and especially what uh, the IMF has been doing, because it's exactly the same mentality. Even though, um, since things are changing, it seems now that the European Commission at the ECB are much more aggressive in austerity terms and in pushing this agenda forward than the IMF. And this is interesting because this was, in the previous year, totally the, 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 the way the IMF was dealing uh, with, with uh, such cases. But now the conflict is basically between uh, a German kind uh, of uh, um, you know, stru uh, structural adjustment and the IMF and the Americans saying that this is kind of enough, and we have to uh, roll back a bit, a bit of austerity, because basically, as I understand it, uh, America needs Europe to recover 
in order for it to recover. And I, I, this is a point that Yanis Varoufakis uh, actually put on the table in his speech. I, I don't agree with him. He said, uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he was trying to be provocative, of course, but he was, he was elaborating on this point. So he said that what the Greek government, uh, a left-wing Greek government should do um, in, uh, in order to stop austerity is to ally with uh, the IMF because the IMF is now uh, <laughs> agreeing, not the good guys, but they have the same agenda. Uh, so to put it, so I I I don't agree with uh, with this opinion, but it, it is an indication for me because Varoufakis is not saying this thoughtlessly. <laughs> he he realizes that uh, uh, that in order to re regain power in this game of uh, you know global hegemony and so on, there are many games that are being played. Um, I think that was all. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you very much. The time slot is exhausted. I think it was a very interesting, substantial debate, which probably would have deserved a bigger audience, just to mention this also. Um, we have now 30 minutes break. I thank all the contributors, Tony, Francisco, Elena, and after 30 minutes we will meet again here to discuss more precisely on uh, the Balkans and the European Union. And yes, and now it's break for all of us. <laughs>